Well, right now we're on the digital strategy panel discussion, and we're talking about implementing appropriate and effective policy and regulatory frameworks to boost AI adoption, enhancing the digital capabilities of the kingdom's workforce to align with AI, creating opportunities to reskill the workforce, to take on the jobs of the future, cross-sectoral collaboration and capacity building in ICT, involving academic institutions, private sector and government, deploying unified communications and collaborations and digital mobility solutions, building a robust localized technology sector to support Vision 2030, e-government services to enable the best digital citizen experience and ensuring effective data governance structures and tackling challenges around trust, uptake skills and capabilities. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we've got with us our panelists, uh, engineer Mohammed Mahanashi, the Information Technology Advisor, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Saudi Arabia. Well, Mohammed Mahanashi has significant experience in driving overall IT operations inclusive of defining the IT roadmap, budgeting, technology evaluation and evangelization and execution of multi-million reals multi-location uh, projects currently working with the deputy minister ministry of technical uh, affairs ministry of foreign affairs uh, riyadh as an advisor to the ministry uh, the deputy ministry of uh, technical affairs well he's somebody who's highly competent ict project uh, service delivery consultant experienced in aligning with national transformation plan 2020 and vision 2030 also joining us is our next panelist, Badar Khan, the Director of Digital Mobility Neom. Well, Badar, Director of the Digital uh, Mobility at Neom, is shaping the world's first integrated smart mobility platform to be operated in Neom. With over 15 years of experience, uh, Badar uh, heads digital roles at both the Fortune 100 companies and startups and has designed digitalization uh, strategy and led global engineering teams to guide smart city and industrial transformation. Also joining would be Yazid al Dilang, the AI advisor of the Saudi Electricity Company. Well, Yazid is an AI advisor, the innovation energy incubator in the Saudi Electricity Company, where he scouts for potential AI applications that are aligned with the company objective. And he also verifies the feasibility of those AI-based solutions Yazid graduated from the King South University with a Bachelor's of Electronics and Communication, 12 years of expertise in AI-based solutions that are re related to utility sector. Also joining us would be our uh, panelist, Edward Gerges, the Principal Advisory Manager of SAS. Well, Edward, a management consultant, executive advisor, and a business director specializing in digitalization across EME, most uh, recently leading initiatives to support telcos and banks in extracting value from advanced analytics insights. And this entire uh, part is, uh, the entire panel is going to be moderated by Marjit Baksh, the IT ad uh, strategy advisor cost. Marjit is an uh, IT advisory uh, uh, strategy advisor responsible for building strategy partnerships and assisting the CIO in leading key IT strategic initiatives at cost. Marjit brings 17 years of experience in developing and executing strategic projects which focus on government, research, and higher education institutions. Well, ladies and gentlemen, with this, we've got our incredible panel on your screen. And thank you so much all for joining us and giving us your valuable time on the World AI Show. Thank you. Over to you. Hi. Hi. Good morning, everybody. And we would like to welcome you on our panel today. Uh, my name is Majid Bakhsh and I work as an IT strategy advisor at King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, KAUST. KAUST, as you may know, is a research-based graduate university uh, located in Saudi Arabia in Thul and with a focus on science and technology. Artificial intelligence and machine learnings are key buzzwords and these are hot topics and that attracts researchers as well. In KAUST, we are doing a lot of interesting stuff around AI. We have a dedicated research center that is focusing on artificial intelligence. We also have several cow startups that are focusing on AI and machine learning with respect to their offerings. And finally, we are also exploring a couple of solutions for digital mobility that involves autonomous shuttles and drones. And this is all involving AI and machine learning. 
The topic that we'll be discussing today in our panel is artificial intelligence and how it drives a digital strategy. We will be hearing from industry experts and vendors about their views and about their journeys with respect to AI. We will also touch upon key governance elements needed for AI adoption. And finally, we will touch upon some examples from digital mobility and e-government services and what role AI plays in that. Next, we'll be having a brief introduction from each of our panel members about their organizations and what key initiatives uh, they are doing in this domain before we start with our questions. Please go ahead. Mohammed, would you like to start? You're on mute. Yeah, uh, do you do you getting my my voice clear now? Yes, we can. Hello. Hear you. Yeah, okay. thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, I want to welcome you, and I want to thank you for this great panel, um, talking about uh, the the AI and and how the government is 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 working in that thing now nowadays. Um, I don't want to add more to this thing because this thing now. Is, uh, we see our government now in Saudi Arabia uh, has uh, an authority specialized in data and AI, which means that we have an, an understanding for, for AI and how uh, it will play, uh, how, how it, it, it will play uh, and add value to the, to the government and also to the beneficiaries within the government itself. That's it. Okay, Badr, would you like to go next? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Majid. Um, thanks, Mohammed and uh, um, Bahavana and Majid for, for the introduction. And uh, really honored to be here and a pleasure to be here and uh, really share the, the virtual stage with everyone here and all the panels today. So as I said, my name is Badar Khan and I'm responsible for building the first fully integrated mo digital mobility platform at Neom. It's going to be a really interesting challenge, and we'll hear a little bit more about those kind of challenges. And really, what we're trying to do is set the benchmark for the cities of tomorrow. Um, here, looking to shift the paradigm from how we think about transportation today to a public transport system that really works for moving people and goods instead of moving transportation across the cities, right? So, we're really looking to shift that paradigm to more user centric uh, type of approaches. So this means really making transportation, these mass transport systems more on demand based, while at the same time considering the impact of transport modes to the environment and carefully really crafting a user journey that fits your particular needs and requirements. Um, so just as a statistic today, just an average commute time in Riyadh is about 50 minutes, just traveling two kilometers and 20 kilometers. I'm sure most of us can attest to that. But now with the virtual world, that's actually changed, right? So there's a lot of paradigm shifts that we're going through. New York City, it's about 24 minutes and Tokyo about, uh, about similar 29 minutes. So with AI, we really wanna change that with the amount of data that we're generating, that you and I generate, and then also capture that along with the transport data that we're, we're gonna be massively generating. So we're really looking to make a public transit system that is powered by analytics, that is more user-centric, accessible, convenient and sustainable. So today I look forward to the session and all of what you guys have to say um, around how AI is transforming your, your particular industry uh, and really listen to the interesting question you're gonna pose to us, Majid, and, and, and the listeners that are on this uh, session as well. So thank you. Thank you, Badr. Uh, Yazid, would you like to go next? Yep, thank you, Majid. Uh, welcome and good day, everyone. It's an honor to be here. Uh, my experience in the uh, utility, utility business. So in the utility business in general, they have the objective and vision to fully digitalize their assets and automate all the functions. Like in electrical utility, there is the concept of smart grid. Smart grid is where you automate functions like self-healing, predictive maintenance, network optimization, energy forecast, and so on. Uh, AI is an essential element in that. It also creates a huge potential and benefits, but 
the first challenge in, when, when you try to, to go uh, uh, this direction is that first you have the, to have the right IT infrastructure and software to build and maintain this data and to do it uh, cost effectively. Thank you, Azid. Uh, Edward? Yeah, sure. So uh, I was just on a presentation where I discussed most of this, but for the purposes of those that uh, weren't on the conversation, uh, I'll just re recap. So with SAS, we're a vendor, we're a software company or a privately held software company. So we're agile and we're able to meet our clients from multiple industries for the purpose of advancing their analytics and their uh, software requirements. So it's, it's a wide spectrum of, uh, of services that we offer. We won't go through that, uh, but you're more than welcome to come and join in the booths today. And we're going to give you an in-depth uh, insight into what we do and how we can help your organization. I'll save some time for someone else. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for the introduction. So uh, let's now move on to uh, the questions that we have uh, for our panelists today. So the first question was, uh, recently, AI has been a key enabler in advancing digital strategies in many sectors. What do you see the role of AI in shaping your organization's digital strategy? And I would start with uh, Better. Do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Um, no, thanks. And that's a very interesting question. So we see AI changing how cities really operate and evolve and make decisions. So it's really about looking at how we can leverage all that data that we generate, put it through some sort of engine and, and analytics engine, and then have a smart AI uh, type of enabled machine learning um, algorithm that helps us to make and bring all of these all of these complex information into a form that we can easily understand, digest, and make quick decisions on. So for mobility, AI changes the way we offer services in general. So instead of designing traditional mass transit systems where we're booked on schedules, where we have fixed schedules, we do ma uh, large planning exercises years in advance to kind of make sure that we're offering the right level of service. We're really looking at that, those data to make it more on demand. So looking at real-time data and then seeing how, do we, how does this data help us to affect the mass transport system that we're offering? Can we make that more on demand, right? Um, thinking more around contactless and seamless payment systems, right? So today, if you go through a, through a public transport system, there is a ticket booth you need to go through, pick up a ticket, then go to a turnstile, and then really go through, through that whole journey. And we, we're looking at how do we make that more streamlined using AI, using the way um, uh, that data can be used to recognize who you are and then say, okay, is this person um, you know, able to ride this particular transport mode and, and really adjust the way you're going through that, that transport system. And then having a unique and I would say pleasant experience instead of you know, a frustrating experience through our tra public transport system. So really looking at you know, if I'm going through, a, through, through Neom or, or even in Riyadh, how, how does my journey when I'm taking that, you know, I can make a pit stop to my favorite coffee shop, have some coffee and then move over and make my way to work or, or you know, meet my friends. So really changing the paradigm on how we think public transport systems work for us. And then we also feel that, you know, what we're, we're, we're trying to do is build a connected, seamless and integrated mobility system. So it feels more natural going through a mobility. It's, and I use a very good, uh, simple example. It's as when you go out, you pick up your car keys, you go into your car, you go from your destination to every stop that you want to make to your final destination. That's how we want to make public transport work for you. So, and, and, and that makes a transport system that's more sustainable, more environmental friendly, and really uh, you can't do that with just you know, an operation theater uh, and things like that. You have to really look at systems that can look at this data at real time, help to bring that data together and then provide you know, meaningful insights. So really powered, for, powered by data and I and analytics. Thank you, Badr. Thank you for this information. Uh, Yazid, do you have, uh, from utility sector, what do you think? Yeah, uh, from the utility sector, actually, AI was not like uh, a luxury part in the utility. It was actually a need. There was challenges for uh, utility, real challenges. And only AI could penetrate these challenges. So this is changes the way that we look at AI and AI application. Uh, we started with the AI, then we first the first reality check that we do 
is the data, of course. How valuable the data, how correct it is, how complete it is, the quality of the data, how we uh, like facilitate the data uh, internally and to our partners. So uh, yes, we, we have success, some success for AI applications, and we're looking to do in the future more, more advanced uh, AI applications. Okay, thank you, Yazid. Um, Edward, how do you see, from a vendor perspective, uh, organization changing their AI or AI changing their organization strategies? And so uh, I think organizations are coming to terms more and more that things are not going to be in the status quo. I think you can, you can specifically see that in the technology sectors, uh, telecom space, which I've been part of for a long time, part of my career, has really had to transform rather than to just to change because the dynamics of of doing business with disruption everywhere it means that uh, there are sectors that are under risk of not just reducing their revenues but completely disappearing in the next five to ten years or or, or longer depending on regulations and how the reg regulations are going to support those industries so uh, some are going to have to change uh, in a sink or swim scenario where others are going to have to take small steps but soon Otherwise, they become irrelevant and obsolete uh, due to competitors coming in and then swooping in. Now, there are different ways of doing that. And I think it really takes uh, a structured mind and a strategic thinking to be able to, to, know, to know how best to approach this. Because, for example, you could go and create a big uh, statistics center or a data center, but that not, might not be relevant to your specific needs. You may only want to have a specific use case that you use to, to develop and to grow your analytics capabilities. Uh, other, other avenues would be to, to, to go and outsource your AI, AI capabilities entirely. And that leaves you subject to the, the risks of, uh, uh, of security breaches and, and such. So really it's not a one case fits all. It, it does require some sort of strategic thinking that is bottom up as I was discussing earlier in, in the keynote, but also uh, a top down. So it's not just from the layer uh, up, but also, how do our how do our how do our, our clients consume that analytics, and uh, how how do we best get uh, how do we how best can we get value out of that analytics to serve our customers? So I would say there is no golden uh, silver bullet here, but uh, it's it's a case by case basis. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for this. And I think this is where we see that this is an important element that needs to be addressed top down. Which brings us to our second question for today is, since we see that AI will be playing a critical role, what do you think we need to have in place in terms of regulations, policies, data governance to enable a soft and smooth AI adaption? Uh, Badr, would you like to go first? Yeah, sure. No, I can, I can uh, you know, take a stab at this. Uh, so I think it's, um, to look at how AI can, we can have better enablement of AI, <clears throat> it's really asking about um, how our regulatory policies and data governments are set up, right? So instead of, you know, offering solutions, I don't think there's, you know, a clear way of just saying, here's the, like Edward said, a golden egg here, and this is how you solve it. I think we need to ask smarter and, and better questions about, you know, how are governments and governance structures set up today to enable AI adoption? And so here, I'm just going to put some thoughts around, you know, for our cities, our cities to think about, and also, um, and what we're thinking about in, in, in Neom um, is really about shifting how governance is set up. So we're, we're really looking to see, we want to move fast, right? So governments are set up where you have a lot of, um, um, uh, I would say, thought process into, you know, is this the right policy? Is this the right regulation? And then really going through the, those hoops can we make that faster, right? So where we learn, so we need to have this entity and this aspect of learning because we enable certain parts of exploitation um, uh, type of uh, activities. And then and at the same time, as we learn, how do we now adopt our governance and having a fast way to adopt our governance regulations and policies? So we need to kind of set up a framework that allows a little bit of play little bit of flexibility and then you know being able to adapt laws and regulations and policies to then uh, enable that because ai is going to uh, make us re move really fast and we're not going to be able to catch up with a lot of things and uh, and and then the other aspect is 
we would then slow down that that trajectory and that acceleration if we start to put in red tape and blo- um, um, and, and bureaucracy type of uh, uh, activities. So it's really thinking about how do we let a small portion of this learning occur? And then from this learning, how do we then quickly change those into small government p- policies, regulations, and, and so forth? So for me, it's about giving digital a front row seat in governance instead of a back row seat where you kind of, uh, you know, go, there's policies, regulations made, and then the technology needs to, you know, adapt to that. So it needs to be the other way around where we need to let technology play and then adapt rules and regulations to, to, to overcome that. At the same time, I think what we also need to do or think about, and a lot of industries and um, cities have already started to do that, is really make cybersecurity front center and, and, and left and right for us, right? So this means really an active form of cybersecurity instead of just a policy and regulatory aspect. So you're really looking at, you know, how are my transport systems or industry sectors, power and gas and, uh, and water and uh, um, electric companies, you know, offering these AI type services and how do I, you know, monitor, regulate and, and adapt to those, those learnings that these sectors are having. So it's really about being, instead of being passive and static, to be more active about um, uh, regulations, policies, and, and data governance. So you, you won't have, I would say, a static model that you can say, here's you know, the standard. It's more about, you know, here's a baseline. And then how do we take that baseline as we learn and incrementally evolve that baseline, just the way we're evolving our understanding of how technology is changing, the way we're doing, we're operating with it, using it, and and um, uh, leveraging it. So, so it's not a solution. I would say it's more about, you know, a dialogue uh, around that. Okay. Measured. I would. Uh, Thank I would you. Actually, uh, I would say it's if, I, if you allow me, measured. Uh, to, sure. Yeah, better. I think you you've hit the nail on the head again. So we're we're talking really here about being able to to have a customized uh, solution for each each uh, entity will will need to have governance policy in place, for example. So it doesn't just, again, come top down. It's not something that we're waiting for the commission of analytics to come and solve everyone's uh, issues, right? I think organizations need to take note that if they don't have governance policies, they're not just going to be subject to uh, security breaches, but they're just not going to be able to leverage the asset that's sitting right down in front of them. So uh, it, it, for sure, it's a case by case basis, and it requires some sort of uh, uh, it requires a strategy that's 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 thought led, that's comprehensive, and uh, it's not a one size fits all again. And and I think uh, we would look be looking into some elements such as data quality, data security, even accessibility as key elements to be able to have a fast response for AI. Otherwise, if you get AI, but the AI is slow in responding, then again, you don't get the benefit that you're actually looking at. So I think there are technical elements to it as well as policy and regulation, correct? Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Yes. Uh, Mohammed, what's your thought on this from a government perspective? Mohammed? Yes, yes, with you. Yes, from government perspective, uh, we see it as a challenge, you know, you know that from government in Saudi Arabia, let me talk about Saudi Arabia and try to summarize some, some points here. And uh, for the government, uh, we, we established a national digitization effectiveness indicators. We established a national digital transformation unit. We also uh, established a, a strategy for the, for the government itself. Uh, for the transform for, and also a committee, national uh, committee for digital transformation. Uh, all these uh, things we we establish in the government to to play uh, a, a main uh, uh, to have a, a, a main goal and to achieve achieve the goals because we know that um, in AI we are working with, between B two B, B two G and G two G. And how to governance these things without a strategy? So we have a strategy. We, you, have, you need a unit to take, to take things for that thing so, so that we have and the NDU. Uh, and we have a committee. Uh, and we have uh, our strategy is, is, is started earlier, started from 2006. We have the first stage, 2006, 2010. Second stage, 2012, 2016. And the third one, we started from 2000, 
and we expect to end by 2022. And uh, those three uh, phases of, of, of the of the transformation of the of this strategy for the for for the for digital education will work, and we believe that it will help uh, all sectors within the within the government in Saudi Arabia. In Saudi Arabia, we are special, specialized. We know that the government is the leader for all the changes that. That, that we see. From earlier, we, we began with Absher, and uh, from in the last days, we saw, we saw Sadaya and what they are doing with, uh, with, with Taba'ud and, uh, and other applications. And we saw Ministry of, of Education and uh, this platform for, for Madrasti. I think government uh, have a, a, lot of change, a lot of changes there. We have to look for specialized persons. We, we have to, to maintain the strategy. And also, we have to work with uh, uh, national. Uh, we, we look to national view, from national view for things there. Um, this is the challenge, and this is how we think that the government could help in, in that thing, and uh, how to lead uh, the market and uh, all entities within, within that. Within that. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, now we move on to the third question, which is more around the workforce. So what do you see as key capabilities uh, in the workforce and uh, that should be there to be able to adopt to the jobs of the future? Uh, Yazid, you want to go first on this? Thank you, Majid. Uh, in order to have a successful AI project or implementation the organization, typically you will focus on two things. One is the business unit and workforce that's being created, or the tools or the lab that you're going to facilitate the data and such. This is good and this is essential actually, but I want to focus on something else I'd like to share, which is similar to what Badr just mentioned. Uh, almost in every AI project I have worked in the past, data was never perfect and the process was never a straight line. Uh, sometimes we request a new type of data. Sometimes we uh, request uh, a better validation mechanism to improve the quality of the data. Or even sometimes we request even a process change, complete process change. So we mostly end up with some changes. Uh, this would require some dynamics and flexibility that are essential while working with AI projects. This is very essential for the other stakeholder of, of the project to be aware of that and have this mindset. Or even better, if we are taking care of this while designing the or creating the new uh, business unit. So it's not just the workforce, it's the mindset as well. Okay, good. Uh, Edward, from your perspective, do you see there are certain things that needs to be there in terms of tools and technologies to be able for the workforce to actually be effective and efficient working with AI? They all have to have SaaS, of course. <laughs> so you mean no. software as a service, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, really. I mean, what we're looking at here is that uh, customers need to balance this technology and business. So uh, when, when we go out and acquire the, 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 the first uh, platform that comes to our mind or the first analytics delivery, then it's not structured and the business is left out of it. Uh, you know, and, and likewise, if the business is, is leading the way and just wants to get the, the, the cheapest solution that is just a quick fix, then they're not thinking things in terms of a grand scheme of a greater, uh, of a greater strategy, then naturally, I mean, there might be a big bang, as I mentioned in the, in the keynote, there might be a big bang use case that looks great and really you know, gets coverage around the world maybe. But then later, I mean, six months down the line or 12 months down the line, that's all that, that's all that happened. So the sustainability of being able to deliver these, uh, these results using AI isn't about quick wins. It's really about developing your core infrastructure that marries with your core value proposition as, as, a, as a company or organization or city. So if, if these two aren't blended, then we're, we're going to be going around in circles and you know, nobody likes to, to, to work on you know, big bang uh, expeditions. Uh, it, it, it's more, It's more. I think for me, uh, the key success factor here is when both of these are, are, are 
completely aligned. And the fruits of that are going to be in an actual transformation of the organization and the, the way that uh, companies and uh, entities are going. So if, if, if the entire direction is changed, then you know that it's going okay. If we're just going around in circles doing use cases that are interesting and they never merge and they never combine together to make really big things that transform our organizations, then it's going to be an issue. Okay. Thank you. Uh, now let's move on to looking at the time. This could be our last question. Uh, let's look at some of the applications. Uh, digital mobility, where do we stand and what is our aspiration there? Uh, Better if you can take this one. Yeah, sure. I, I guess I'm the mobility guy here today. But anyways, <laughs> um, coming from a background of AI, I think there's a, a whole plethora of different types of applications that you can have. But um, within mobility, I think we have a big wave coming. Um, so it, and it was really thrusted by di digital technologies. Um, we've seen the first wave moving from personal vehicles to shared services, right? So that was the first wave where Uber-like type of services and that kind of took over the world. Then we kind of started experimenting that with transit systems and saying, okay, can we apply this type of model to the service-based model to transit? They're already public services. Can we make them more on demand, that, that, uh, that type of paradigm shift? Then we, we started to say, okay, well, we did that on you know, personal cars. We did that on transit. Can we now do that on micro-mobility services, right? So you have uh, the, um, the consciousness of the environment working with redu reducing CO2 to, to enable these, you know, um, you know, using your bike, using active mobility, using electric motor, uh, electric scooter type of services, right? So you're really conscious about the environment. So you're really going from, you know, you're, you're very CO2 intensive to, you know, something in the middle with public transport and then really on the other side to go green, right? So, but all of these platforms, if you look at it, it's, it's really isolated, right? So you have something for your personal cars, you have something for your transit system, then you have something for your micro mobility services. And then you have to navigate, if you open up your phone, you'll have like four different apps or 10 different apps to kind of go through each of these types of systems, right? So now, and, and, then, the, and then you can forget about the, the payment thing, right? So you've set up your card uh, information on each one of these applications separately. So it's all sparse and uh, segregated. So I think the next wave is really about taking all of these systems that we've built, all these learnings that we've had, and then taking that for, uh, to start thinking about, you know, how, how do you make that user centric first, right? So, cause I want to plan a, a journey through the city that goes through all of these different mobility modes and, and, and creates for me a seamless integrated type of mobility journey. Then we look at, you know, um, can we have an application that when we go to a city that it, it, it brings us integrated personalized aspect to it. So the next wave is about looking at, we have all of these things, bringing it all together, offering it as a service to the city and then your, your public citizens having it personalized. So this is where AI also uh, comes in where we've experimented on small scales where now we're kind of saying, okay, you, we now integrated all these things. Now we want to make these journeys very personalized for each of the users that is going through our, our systems, right? Uh, and it's really unique way of thinking about mobility. So it's, it's actually going to be a new wave of thinking about how mobility services. And then with, with, before you had to go to a mobility service, now we're looking at, you know, how does mobility come to us, right? With autonomous shuttles, autonomous vehicles, and how do we make that more connected journey seem closer, just like the personal car, right? Because that's our benchmark to say, you know, I want to pick up my keys, I want to get into a car, and I want to go to my destination. How do you make that work as a from a public transport system perspective? So I think that's going to be the new wave um, for, for mobility. And then th we're, we're thinking still land. So now we have to kind of move from land to more sustainable type of services. So I'll leave it at that as a teaser. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, I think we are uh, good on time. We can open the floor for Q&A. Uh, sure, we, we can do that. So we've got a couple of, one question for sure. I'll, I'll just be uh, checking from the audience link, which is provided. Firstly, thank you so much to the entire panel for joining us on the World AI Show. And uh, we have a question which is coming up uh, right now. Okay, I just refreshed. Yeah, it's from Balaji. 
and Balaji asked that would the esteemed panel talk about the importance of AI ops as part of operationalizing AI from a concept to being a part of the daily life of an organization and IT being the resortory uh, of algorithms. Could anyone take that up? You want me to repeat the question once again for all of you? Mm -hmm. Yes, please, if you can repeat the question. Okay, uh, could you talk about the importance of AI operations ops as part of operationalizing AI from a concept to being a part of the daily life of an organization? That's from Balaji Ranganatha. I mean, I, I can take a stab at this, but uh, from, let's say, a smart city perspective, let's say if you are in the, in the end, we're talking about, let's say, mobility concept fits into the bigger picture of smart city, you would say that you would have, uh, let's say, a city operation center, similar to what we have as a network operation center, where you have all the data feeds from all the different systems and AI coming in together. And based on that, that system, that city management system will make or help facilitate those decisions. So this is where I would say the AI ops would play a role. But again, I'm talking from a smart city element because this is where, you know, all the integrated AI would, would come in handy. Yeah. Sure. Uh, would anyone else like to take a yeah, cue I, on I, that? I yes, want, please, Edward. Yeah, I, I, want to, I want to add, to add one more point there is uh, within the government itself. And government itself, um, many times uh, we depends on the decision. And uh, we know that uh, having the data, having the, the right AI system to analyze and to, to summarize the, the data that we have, helping us to make the right decision. So within day-to-day -day business, within day-to-day -day business, on day-to-day -day work, we need uh, a decision supporting uh, and supportive uh, systems that helps us using AI. We know that, um, let me talk about uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs. Now, Minister of Foreign Affairs, you, you need, you will need uh, uh, such an AI uh, solution that helps you to make the right decision and gives you uh, all the data uh, and all the needed data uh, to help you support that decision within, within time. So it should be in continuous base. Uh, if I am looking um, from my expertise to the Ministry of, of Finance, for, for, for an example, uh, we, we, we already there, we need an AI system that helps to make the, the financial decisions and uh, to make the, uh, all, all your financial work and day-to-day -day business working fine and within the accurate data and, and help you to make the, the right decision. If, if we look to Ministry of, of, of Economic and, uh, and Planning, planning need uh, a lot of data that if you go uh, to work with, with, with all this data on paperwork, it will not help you and it will take time. And going through an AI system to help you to achieve this goal is also is, is a must. If I am talking about Ministry of Education, uh, you have a lot of data there. We have, we have scholarships. And, and uh, if you look for scholarships, uh, students to support them. Even you go uh, within this, the, the, the scholarships uh, to have a lot of people to help these this students, or you will you will need an, uh, a system that uses AI to help you to achieve the day-to-day -day business and to look to what you need now and how to make decision and how to support the students within their within their uh, education time. If we look to the Ministry of Health now, the Ministry of Health, uh, they have a lot of data that uh, we talk about patients, we talk about doc uh, doctors, we talk about, uh, about, about the, uh, the medical centers. Uh, we ha you, you are having, you're having there a lot of data and uh, you need an AI to help you uh, from all this data to help to answer to the, to the questions of the patients, uh, to guide them to go to the right clinic. Uh, for the doctors themselves, they, they need uh, an AI system to help them if they give uh, the, the situation that, that, that they have or, or the disease that they have, it helps you that, okay, we measured that in British, we, uh, we measured this and that, and this is the situation. So 
the, the options that we have is A, B, or C, uh, go to operation, or maybe this medicine or that medicine, or, and also to establish a new business. But I think within the government, AI is a must, and uh, it should play uh, a main role uh, in this day business uh, there. Very quickly, if I may add as well, I think uh, sure, thank you, Muhammad, that, that's, uh, that's a broad uh, visibility of all the analytics that, uh, that, that you're going through. But uh, we, we used to talk about uh, democratization of data, and this used to be a beautiful thing that everyone can have access to data. But just answering directly to the question of uh, AI ops, today you don't just want to have uh, democratization of data at all. Now it's like you're only giving me data, and you, that means you're, you know, I, I got a file recently from uh, from uh, from someone that just had data in it, and I was I was not happy, right? So what I actually want is the ability to then uh, do plug and play analytics while I'm at my desk without the necessary use of uh, external platforms, if necessary. So a cloud-based solution that can get me access to the data, that can get me access immediately to the insights that I need to be able to make my immediate decision. So democratization of data is in the past. Right now, we're looking at democratization of analytics insights that executives and decision makers can plug and play instantly to get results that they can make key decisions on. So uh, that, that would be my take. Sure. Thank you so much, Edward. Uh, also, we have two more questions. If you know, uh, the panel could just touch upon these two. Uh, first up, uh, I'm just uh, directing this to our moderator if he can guide me as to who can take the question. One is from Ibrahim who asks, what accuracy percentage of data needs to be achieved to qualify for AI solution? That's from Ibrahim, one of our attendees. And the second question, if you can see in your chat says, can I apply AI for tourist transport mobility? That is from Mansoor. So these are the two questions. If uh, Majid, uh, Baksh, if you could uh, help me to direct that to your panel, please. Thank you. Sure. I think, uh... Yazid, would you like to touch upon the accuracy percentage of data needs to, that is required to qualify for AI solution based on your experience in developing AI applications? Yeah, sure. I, actually, um, in each project, we spend more time with the data than actually developing the AI solution. So this really depends on the, on the objective. What is your objective? How, how sensitive? Uh, the decision or, or the output of AI, is it related to patient or is it related to just normal work? So this really depends on the objective. Also depends on the like, what are you going to use? Supervise machine learning? What, what, what type of AI are you going to use? So these two actually, uh, when we look at them together, the objective and what type of AI or technology of AI, both of them, then we can decide, we, do we have enough accuracy or not? Okay, thank you. And the first, the second question, can I apply AI for tourist transport mobility? I think that our mobility guy will take that. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, sure, sure, I could take that. I, th I think the, the simple answer is yes, you can apply that to any type of transport mode, right? And you really, what you have to do is, and we're, we're really also thinking about that. And how do you apply this when, when it's not a journey from your city? So it's really, a, you know, something outside, somebody uses your service. Um, of course, that, that would be a natural starting position for you to, to apply this AI type of uh, approach. Um, you really have to think about, you know, what are the aspects of the city that you need to consider? Right. Um, and the, 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 the points of interest and things like that. So it's a little bit of a different problem, but it's still applicable for, for those type of uh, scenarios as well. Uh, and maybe going back to the, 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 the question about the, the accuracy, it's really about inference. Right. At the end of the day, machine learning is about inference. Right. So if you can prove from the data set that you have and the quality and the quality of data is more of judgmental, right? Because you're, you're going back and kind of creating the, the um, percentage weights to it and then applying it to a, a machine learning algorithm. It's about the inference that you, you put out. Does it actually meet or, or address the, the outcome that you're looking for before you let the, the whole algorithm go loose on, you know, all sorts of data? And then tying it back to the ops aspect of it, right? So the ops, we go back to our traditional software 
principles and, and how we, we've developed software over the years. It's ground CI, CD type of operations, right? So we're, when we develop software, we're going through this continuous testing, AB type of testing. We're going through, through looking at, you know, how does, um, when we put in a certain module into our software, right? How does that affect the whole scheme of the, 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 the software itself? AI is similar to that. It's not a, it's a piece of code, right? And then you're applying different data and algorithms to it or data and insights to it. Um, you have to monitor and say, is it actually going towards the direction uh, that I would like to, to, to affect in the city? So if I'm optimizing towards um, um, energy uh, utilization, then you know, that's the kind of data set that you need to consider. If you're looking for environmental friendliness or personalization, you need to consider, do you have that data set within your, your input layer to, to affect that. So it's, it's a continuous whole cycle, kind of wrapping the whole life cycle of you know, how you build AI engines um, in this one whole uh, response. Thank you. Okay. Sure, thank, thank you, you so better. much. Uh, so if I could request Majid, though we're uh, done with our time, if you'd like to give any closing statements before we conclude. Um, I think, Basically, what we have covered today was looking at how we would go about a digital strategy and what AI can play there. And we've, we've seen how we have strategy elements in terms of planning. We have governance, quality, uh, data elements to it, as well as skill set. And as, as Yazid mentioned, also mindset. I mean, there are a lot of things that goes into having the right AI strategy set in place. Uh, we've touched also about... Uh, uh, another interesting, I think, interesting example about mobility, and we can see that mobility. When you talk about digital mobility, there is a lot of AI elements into it. And when you look at the bigger picture, then you, that whole mobility gets into the smart city element. Then it gets into the data quality element, and again, it's it's uh, the data operations element. So it's all one big AI, let's say, domain that has so many different components to it. And yeah. And I think I wish all the luck to all the organizations want to start any initiative on AI. Uh, it's not going to be an easy one, but I think, yeah, I think it can grow one by one. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much. And thank you to our entire panel for joining us. Thank you for giving us your time. Mm -hmm. Thank you also. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Pleasure meeting all of you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.